Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're going to be talking about diplomatic attitude and diplomacy in Total War Three Kingdoms. So Total War Three Kingdom is one of the best Total War games in terms of dealing with the campaign and diplomacy, but many players don't really pay attention to a thing called diplomatic attitude, and it's built in into how diplomacy works in Three Kingdoms. So we'll be talking over uh, all the different uh, grades of uh, friendship or hostility you can have with other factions, how to interact and change these, and how to take advantage of these in terms of actually pushing through diplomatic deals once you have them at a certain level and what they can do for you. So you can see here on the 200 start for Tall Tall's faction, uh, the map absolutely hates us. Uh, the only factions we have that are slightly uh, favorable to us are the neutral factions here. And they're actually, if you look at diplomacy, our vassals and our ally, whereas everyone else is at war with us. Now, does this mean that our relationship is really determined by these diplomatic stances? Not really. Uh, you're going to be able to see that you could actually go to war with someone to turn them into your best friend. Uh, it's very possible uh, once you get a hang of what really matters in terms of diplomatic attitude. And how can that really help you uh, when you do make diplomatic deals? So if we open up the diplomacy screen and take a look at these faces on the right, they are your diplomatic attitude. And right now, we're struggling with this on turn one for Tal Tal, mainly because we have something called minus 20 faction influence or minus 18 for certain factions uh, due to some very strange math, but it's really minus 20. Uh, the reason why we have it is because we're currently the Prime Minister of the Han Empire, and there is this minus 20 diplomatic relations with all factions. Anytime you see a tagline such as diplomatic relations with certain factions, subgroups like the Han factions, uh, the Yellow Turbans, uh, the Bandits, this type of relationship will be uh, impacted on your attitude in something called faction influence. Another thing that could happen with faction influence is if you vassalize someone and promise them uh, autonomy or you liberate them, you get a nice burst of that as well. So that's a very uh, mysterious line that many people don't understand. And we can kind of tweak that if we want. We do have uh, schemes. We're one of the few factions that can really uh, mess with diplomacy. We can use something called the rival tiger and one prey. And once we use this for plus 20 relationship with all factions and we pop back into diplomacy to look at these values, uh, the current value will not change, but you can see the faction influence is now plus 2 from negative 18. Same thing there. So either they will go to 0 if it was negative 20 before, or they will go to 2 if they were negative 18. So in the case of Sun Tzu, we erased it. But you can see that his current value, or the value that he had at the start of turn, is still minus 20. It's trending towards zero. You're getting a growth where he's going to go towards neutral. But until the current value changes to zero, any sort of diplomatic dealings you deal with him will be same as before, even though you increase that relationship. Now, how do these attitudes impact your deal making? Well, if we pull up a deal with Sun Tzu and any type of deal, whether that's you know non-aggression pack, and you hover over there is this opinion on this idea. I think for any players of Total War Three Kingdom, you definitely have seen this when you try to make peace, when you try to annex, when you try to uh, confederate. Sometimes you'll see a minus 100 on the opinion. And sometimes that's because they don't like the deal. But often, it's linked directly to their attitude towards you. If they are in the unfriendly range, you'll most often see minus 10. Now, sometimes these opinions will shift based on their personality. This is something that's very hard to kind of cover, as there are many, many personalities in the game uh, for both uh, the factions that are playable and the non-playable factions with generic characters. Because oftentimes, the generic characters will spawn slightly different personalities from game to game. Even if you're granting independence to them, in the same game, they could end up with different personalities. So it's not locked. And that's mainly because traits can be gained uh, in games uh, randomly, and it's going to have an impact on their personality. So personality definitely has a huge 
uh, determinations into how deals are made. And you can see things like cunning, where on the last one it says diplomatic attitude only has a limited influence on diplomatic decisions. So these things will add a wrinkle into what you can expect from diplomatic attitude. But in essence, if you are uh, using this, so right now we can see this is plus 3.9, mainly due to our strong military uh, strength and strategic influence. That's going to be your main driving force in diplomacy. Whenever you're making a deal, having a stronger army on the field will play a big role in determining how strong you can push deals through because you can overpower things like opinion on this idea. But sometimes you might reach a max military strength. For example, in the late game, when you have a full army set of, say, 25 armies, sometimes you can't get more armies and you have the best unit in those armies, you'll be close to somewhere around 50 points and you can't really push it that much higher. The only trick that I have determined you can do is have dedicated uh, administrator generals that will be sitting inside the commandery, meaning they're on your bench, not on the field. And those unit will also be considered part of your standing army. I assume that will also include a garrison that you gain from military infrastructure. And essentially you can gain a small boost. We're talking about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 to your military strength. And that might help you out a little bit. But mainly when you want to push deal through, you have to lower the opinion on this idea to zero. Uh, that way they don't have a negative factor there. Sometimes you could see a positive one, but that really turns on the type of deal you're pushing and the personality that they have. So in this case, the negative 10 is reflection of his current negative 20 value. And if you want to push current attitude towards trending attitude, the best trick in the game is to offer a payment of one copper coin. And the reason why this work is that the game will check for the trend at the end of every deal you make with all the factions in the game. So when I make this one coin payment, it will refresh the value closer and closer towards trending for all your factions. And you can see Sun Tse here is now at negative 15. And depending on how far away, the amount you gain will be different. So if we're currently at negative 200 and we're trending towards zero, we're gonna get 60, 70 points with one such refresh. Here from negative 20 to negative 15, or negative 20 to zero, we only get five points. And you can do this infinite number of times until you get it to zero. Now, uh, this is not gonna do anything from negative 20 to negative 15. We're still in the same color block zone, and these color block zones gonna determine uh, what the opinion are. So unless he moves out from unfriendly to neutral, the value that we see here is gonna stay at negative 10. So let's first push him out just to get an example. And we're gonna use military access as our anchor point. You can see this deal, much more important and much stronger than non-aggression is opinionated at negative 13, even though he's in the exact same uh, attitude range as us. And he's giving us different military power depending on the type of deal as well. So there's a lot of intricate detail to diplomacy. Uh, in terms of the positive factor and negative factors and you have to really um, kind of check things out to get used to them we're not going to use any of the special ones but let's just say we sign this deal you can see his attitude trend will trend from zero towards 25 doesn't mean his current attitude will jump to 25. Uh, it won't be a negative 15 anymore because what will happen when you make this deal is that he will calculate from his current negative 15 towards his trending 25 and you get a few points. And if we want to push for attitude through deal making, you can definitely do that because the attitude score comes in a couple folds. Right now, he has no factors influencing it, right? The blocks are empty, whereas you see with Renshaw, there's things like personal rivalry, war with us, war with our friend, treaties with our enemy. So those are things that's gonna matter. Um, in this case, if we sign a non-aggression pact, that's a treaty with them. So we'll also gain some positive points there. That's really reflected in the 25. If we want to push it faster and higher, the values here that you have to uh, get used to are 5.0 and 15.0.
So at those values, you get a jump in terms of how much attitude you're getting because it's a considered a favorable deal for them. So in this case, we're going to offer him one food for 10 turns, and that's going to add up to 5.0. If we hover over, it has jumped to 35 points. And if I somehow decide to give him 10 more point worth of items, maybe the red hair, that's worth only 4.5 because, of course, the AI discount all your gold items. Um, that's going to be 9, and that's going to be 10. So we're at 15 points exactly, and that's going to be 70 points. So we went from 25 from just the fact that we're going to get a treaty together to 10 extra points for reaching 5.0 or a very favorable deal for him now to 15 points which is giving us additional 45 points and this is a good way to gain points now of course i'm not going to be giving him these gold items but we'll use the 5.0 to demonstrate here and as this deal is signed if we check his value again we're going towards from negative 15 to 35 it actually didn't refresh which is interesting but you can see where deals are giving us points. 20 points for having a treaty, 15 points for giving him a favorable deal. These things will decay over time. So you see the value here, war with us, it didn't start in negative 18, and war with our friend didn't start in negative 14. Depending on how many turns it has been, it will decline as well. The personal rivalry here is actually never gonna change. In game, grudges um, will give you negative 50 in terms of satisfaction in the campaign if you share them in the same faction and it will also give you a negative attitude factor if you guys are both faction leaders so if you and any faction leader have a grudge you will never overcome this negative 50 you'll always be factored into any sort of diplomacy deals you make the only way to try to get rid of this is repeated capture and release hoping to develop fondness, which will cancel it out with a positive 50. So uh, you can basically try to build friendship with factions or maybe your vassals uh, that you're hoping to grant independence by granting independence to people who has a fondness towards you, whether they're generals you have captured and released, which is usually the best one. So let's say I'm fighting a faction. I capture one of the generic generals that I have no use for, but I hired them meaning that they will have this fondness toward my faction since they were captured and hired, not executed, and we grant them independence, then that vassal faction will always have 50 points in our favor because of that fondness that was developed until that faction leader dies of old age or uh, battle uh, death. But in general, that's a great way to build diplomatic relations with a vassal faction. Now back to our current value here. We want to see the change. So I'm gonna give him a coin again, and that's gonna be a great way of shifting him. Now the difference is 50 points in between, and you see that he has bumped to negative three. The color has shifted towards neutral, but negative three is not really neutral now, is it? Right, we're still in the negative zone. So while the color has shifted, it's actually not neutral yet. Neutral is defined at zero points. So we're going to give him one more. Now he's officially in the zero range. Neutral is anything from zero to 15. Friendly is 15 to 59. Very friendly is 60 to 149. And best friend is 150 and above. So once you reached 150 diplomatic attitude with any faction, you have reached the max in terms of what you can get from them for the opinion reduction. So if we go back to deal making with him now, and we look at the same exact deal, his opinion has not shifted. This is actually super interesting. And I think this has to do with his personality. And he's giving me a tough time in terms of what I want to do with him. Because this number should have gone down, right? When you shifted from one tier to the next, the value for opinions should have shifted and perhaps we can check with a marriage instead hmm opinion negative 18 well let's do it one more time no point to give up now since I was already 
taking our deals, and we can shift it to 15 and above, right? 16 points. 14, so one more coin. And we're going to move him into our friendly zone. And you can see that it's going to turn green. There we go. Once you're above 15, you are going to be in the friendly zone. And let's see if there are any changes. Finally, he's giving us one point. I think a lot of this is actually from personality. And that's something that we highlighted early on. Personality is going to be very key. Uh, a lot of people don't check these out because, you know, kind of ignore this. But there's a lot of things that are very useful to know. So, for example, here, Golgan is honorable. He will not not honor treaties. He will always honor treaties. More willing to sign deals with respectful leaders, people with trustworthiness. And also harder to bribe in diplomacy. So any of those favorable deals are not going to happen. And they make diplomatic decisions based almost exclusively on diplomatic attitude. So you can depend on them to follow the rules of the attitude values completely in terms of whether he will declare war on you. So oftentimes you freak out over AI faction declaring war on you even though you're best friends. Well, it could be that there are kind of a treacherous person, or in this case, cunning person, right? Diplomatic attitude only has a limited influence. Some people have almost no influence. And then there's also good vassals with dependent, uh, with the underdog personality here that admires large factions. And some people absolutely hate large factions if they have things like defiant. And then you can check out everyone's personality. This is actually very key. And then you have pacifist, someone who doesn't want to declare war, who's protective, doesn't want to lose land. Uh, aim to have an empire of vassals and tributaries. So this basically dictates how AI factions will play. And this is actually pretty Sir crucial for to know. Balance, bandit queen with different personalities. So this is just a title for a lot of the unique characters. You want to look at the traits, right? Destructive, commanding, strategic, uh, bill uh, belligerent. And you have opportunist raiders. That's why he's in raiding stance so much. Protective and cunning, balanced, defiant. This is someone who dislikes large and aggressive factions. Never stay a subordinate. If you get a vassal like this, he's going to definitely rebel against you. You might as well release him. Uh, that way he's not a vassal to you, but just a friendly faction. So he doesn't have to feel like he's a subordinate in that case. And they also have trusting, which is one of the best vassals you can have because they're naive. They're willing to do business deals with even the most treacherous leaders. When you have untrustworthiness, there's a penalty towards any deal you make unless they have trusting or they just don't care. And they also never see anyone as a strategic threat. So it doesn't matter if how big they are, right? Proximity, distance is also a factor, how big the army are. And uh, they will always do deal with you without those factors being taken into consideration when you make a deal. So personality is very, very crucial, and we're already getting to see it with Sun Tzu making the deal here. He's not giving us as much as we should get when we do dip below. So this was negative 18, now it's still negative 17. Uh, basically, he's not giving us too much credit here. Now, there's also things like character worth, distance between the two factions. Uh, the closer you are and the stronger you are, uh, you are going to kind of scare him with uh, the aggressiveness right the diplomatic threat analysis you can check your threat here right we're considering minor threat right now but every other faction will have a slightly different calculation against you depending on how strong they are and how close you are so those are all things that are going to play a factor so the military strength that's positive 27.6 that's relative between you and Sun Tzu and the distance is relative between you and Sun Tzu the character worth is Lady Wu's character worth to their faction and distance, of course, uh, we already talked about that. And we're really trying to tweak opinions here. And the goal here is to showcase the tiers, right? We're going from negative, negative 20 to zero, uh, which actually didn't bring any change, unfortunately, due to his personality. And then once we shifted to friendly, we're finally seeing one point given to us. And um, this is going to be a huge factor in the late game if you want to do any sort of confederation, which is probably the best way to absorb factions. And how confederation works is if you can force someone into a best friend status with you, the opinion against being confederated, thus losing your faction, will drop to negative 50. 
that's the minimum value you will deal with in confederation. And when you see that, you're hoping that your some some sort of attitude will play into your favor where you don't have other negative factors at play. And then the other thing you can only do is hopefully your military strength against that faction can overcome the 50. And sometimes you can't get there. Sometimes you're going to be close. So for example, here we have a vassalization. You see his opinion on this idea. This is going to be the same thing as confederation. Being vassalized, being confederated, the opinion are always going to be extremely negative. Sometimes you're going to see another minus 100 on top, and which I, I suspect is what he had when he had negative opinions of us uh, to begin with. Now that we're finally in the positive land, you just see a core negative 95 at friendly. I believe at very friendly, this will drop to negative 75. And then at best friend, this will drop to negative 50, assuming this is a normal faction. For him, I suspect that he has a 10 point increase on all these opinions. So I think maybe negative 60, negative 85, negative 95 here. And you see the only thing you can really do here is use your military strength. Now the wider diplomatic impact is how all the other factions on the map will feel about this. And this can help you if, say, they're in a lot of wars. So a lot of factions want to see them get absorbed and get destroyed, uh, essentially. So that's going to be things that you see when you make a deal. Sometimes when you make a deal, you see other factions name under the attitude consequence, as in other factions going to care about uh, what happens when you uh, get this done. So like if we declare war, you see the other factors adding in here, right? And that's going to play into the wider uh, diplomatic uh, changes for that faction. So Sun Tzu is seeing that his change of people that surround him to kind of give you a point value there. So that's really how values work here. And that's going to be a big part of the game that most people don't pay attention to. And right now in the first turn, there's not a lot of factors at play. So what we're going to do is we're going to load into the final turn of the Tall Tall campaign that I did for Fates Divided and take a look at what the values look at look like at the end of the game to see what has really changed things, how values have gone into the extreme, and how you can pay attention to things that happen during war, which we mentioned at the beginning of this video that plays a huge part in terms of determining whether factions becomes your friends or your enemies. Because even when you're at war with a faction, you have a lot of control over whether that faction will end up liking you or not. So let's hop to a late game. Alrighty, and we loaded into a game for Fates Divided for Cao Cao on turn 48, where all of China's three emperors has been united. And uh, it's not a clean campaign, which is good because there's a lot of other factions still on the map. And if we take a look at attitude, most of them hate us. Absolutely hate us, hostile, but it doesn't mean they're at war with us. Some are vassals and absolutely hate us. Some are our allies and absolutely hate us. So what happened here? And how could factions like Sha Ke, who we really had no dealings with, love us? So let's pop into diplomacy one more. And you can see that um, this time we have Liu Xie as our leader because we did the restore option. And if we sort this, let's first take a look at Sha Ke. Why does he like us? Well, in this case, it's actually quite simple. He's in a war with a lot of the Han factions that we were fighting. And because we were killing his enemies, he loves us due to war atrocity against our enemies. Now, this could easily become a negative factor if we commit war atrocity against friends. And this is a huge influencing factor in the game. Right? This alone pretty much brought us most of our positive points. Uh, 280 is our total positive, 188 from war atrocity with our enemies. And we have treaties with their friends, other non faction we signed deals with. War with our enemies. So what determines enemies and friends? Well, if you click on a faction, you can see their attitude against the rest of the map. And that's really what's going to determine enemies and friends. But if we go back, we just negotiate and look at this. You can see things like war with our enemies, signed peace with them. We fought a little bit and signed a peace. And then things that are negative factors, release generals of our enemies. That's considered mercy. So when you do fight, whether you capture enemy generals at the end, 
executing will make faction that that faction hate you will also make friends of that faction hate you if you release that faction will like you and the factions that are friendly to it will like you but factions that are not friends with that faction will hate you which makes perfect sense quite a mouthful though and this is the case here so when we release generals even though the faction we're fighting is gonna love us his enemies in this case shamoku is gonna count that against us strategic threat is based on our size if you come here it went from minor threat which we saw earlier now to a dominant threat and it's maxing out at negative 20 and that's really something you just have to live with in the end game you can't really overcome that honorable treatment of soldiers of our enemy this is another big one and one that most people mess up on after each fight you have the option to ransom siege supply and recruit which gives you money military supply which you should never take and the last one is replenishment if you ransom you are essentially releasing the troops that is the most favorable outcome you can get if you want to become friendly with the faction you are at war with and their friends if you recruit and gain replenishment back which i know a lot of players do that faction will hate you because that's considered an unhonorable treatment of their troops and consider a war atrocity so if you want to build up friendship you almost always want to take ransom you almost always want to release or hire the generals that has been captured if on the other hand you want to use a war to become friends with factions that are against a faction so a best example of this is you're playing as a han faction and you want to be friendly with other Han factions so you can confederate them. Then go to war with bandits, Nanman factions, or uh, yellow turban factions, and be absolutely merciless against them. Recruit after every battle, execute all their generals, and for all the remaining Han factions who hopefully are in wars with them, you will see the value skyrocket similar to this 188 that we see with war atrocity against our enemies. And that's a great way to build friendship. So war is an excellent tool in the game to really change the value going around. Of course, if you don't have this setup in the late game, money is also a great way because you could easily create 5.0 or 15.0 to kind of push for deals. Now this is crazy high, but you can see it maxes out at 15. So you can just lower it by a bunch and uh, bribe them basically to push the value up. It doesn't say anything here, but it's gonna make a change. So right now we're at trending 201. Push this deal through, trending 251, right? That bribe had a 50 point increase. Now you just need to get it over 150, I repeat. Going any higher doesn't do you anything. He's currently at 149, which is at the edge of very friendly and best friends. So we're going to give him one to refresh that value over 150. And you can see the teal color change here. Now, the unfortunate part is he's a Nunman faction, so I can't showcase any sort of vassalization points. Um, but maybe if I ask him for an item, hopefully he has one. He doesn't have one. So we can't even see the opinions on that. All right, not much we can do with him. Let's jump to a Hun faction. We have our vassal faction over here, I believe. No, actually, he's a he's a civil war faction that we created, who's friendly to us because we were beating up the civil war uh, other side of the faction. All right, so you can see here, faction influence. That's due to things like diplomatic increase with all factions with Hun factions, and we have a bunch of that, and it's giving us 70 points. It's great. It's a late game. And we're playing as the Han Empire, so that definitely helps. War atrocity against our enemy, another big point. War with our enemy, treaties with our friends, other values. Other values are just things that happen that doesn't categorically fit into it. It's hard to tell what exactly it is right now, but uh, there's always things like other values in the late game because of things that have happened. Um, it's not things that will show up. So things that will show up are these like different war atrocities, strategic threat, faction influence, if you trespass, it will have a thing called trespass. I think it's negative 15 for each turn that you trespass. So if you want to be someone's enemy real quick, you can just trespass a bunch of time if you want. Um, 
highly don't advise. And here for the negative factors that he has is release generals of our enemies. So while it's nice to try to build that fondness and try to capture someone through battle, be mindful that when you're fighting a faction like that, and they have enemies too, sometimes maybe your vassals are at war with them. That's why vassals end up hating you, because your vassals think like they're fighting this shared enemy for you, and all they hear is that you have humanely released their troops. You have honorably released their generals, and they're going to just slowly hate you, which is the case here. And that's something you have to just really overcome, or hopefully you end up getting a vassal with a personality that's not so aggressive and that they just don't care about it. Like someone who's an underdog trait that will be a great vassal who just will not complain. And if you're big and aggressive, they'll like you. So uh, that's why most of our vassals hate us. And sometimes that's a surprising thing to hear, but that's part of the game. So sometimes if you're hoping to form vassals to control your corruption in the empire, or if you're hoping just to get a trade deal out of them, I highly advise just uh, after you create a vassal, let's say here, this is a vassal we have. The second you create them, offer them autonomy, which is going to bring a huge increase to the attitude. And then immediately after, grant them independence so they're no longer your vassal. So they're not dragged into wars with you. You end up with just a friendly faction who is still a custodian of a land that you don't need. And they're still a trade partner. The one thing that's a drawback of this is that their land will not count towards your victory condition of 95 land. So if you have a huge, you know, uh, vassal, don't do this. But if you have a one county vassal that you created for trade, this is absolutely the play where you uh, should just liberate them uh, afterward. You get the trade, you don't get the tribute. I don't think the tribute income from vassals are ever, you know, amount to much. And if we take a look at diplomacy here, you can see that our regular income from vassals, barely a thousand. Xu Zhao is giving us because he has Danyang, like the most lucrative commander in the game, the entire piece. He's only giving us a thousand per turn. Now, if you're playing someone with as Liu Biao or Zheng Jiang in your faction that can boost these tribute with a percentage, maybe it'll be worth it. But Danyang in our hands will be worth closer to 10k. Right, if we fully develop Danyang, that's closer to 10k per turn. And he's giving us, you know, a fraction of that, one tenth of that, by owning him as a vassal. So ideally, you pick out a small county that you don't need, you grant them independence, and you get the trade deal from them, and that's good enough because the trade is fairly valuable. You're getting closer to, you know, 2k per turn by creating such a trade deal. So that's something you should definitely consider. All right, back to our diplomatic discussion. Uh, now we can look at some of the factions that hate us and why they hate us. So you can see here, the negative value really just comes from war and hostile spy actions. Yes, if you have a spy return to you or get captured, that's the worst case. Uh, but if you do have them return to you, they're gonna know that you had a spy in their faction and you get this hit of negative uh, spy action. So it really comes down to trying to collect generals or really mess with your diplomatic relationship because you're constantly releasing generals hoping to get fondness and you're constantly trying to treat a faction right to try to get them to become uh, your vassal in the future perhaps or confederate them by building up that friendship. So you're doing a lot of nice things to a faction you're at war with and you end up messing up your relationship with your friends who might have joined that war with you and spying on them to try to pick up their characters, uh, get discovered when you do pick up their characters, will also mess up these relationship with them. And you have other things that's showing up like recent positive event involving us. Uh, that might be a game mechanic. So sometimes you get an early game diplomacy thing where you pick between three options. Sometimes you see the plus 40, plus 80 relationship. That's going to show up right here with the event. Uh, treaty with us, faction influence, that's really thankful for the High Empire thing. And uh, yeah, that's going to really wrap it up here. Also, eliminating a faction, All right, that's a huge one too. If you can, and you probably should always try to do, when the faction's almost dead, as in you've taken all their land, and hopefully they have an army on the field, peace out with them. 
don't be the faction that kills the faction. There is no benefit to wiping out a faction. You get a grudge with everyone who's in the leadership circle with that faction. Actually, no, with everyone in the faction, because they will all remember you wiped out their former faction. So it would be harder to gain them in uh, recruitment pools or from spies. And even if you do gain them, the grudge will stay. So it's always better to leave a faction barely dead, but without any land, right? If you let them keep land, they will recover quite nicely. So eliminate all their land and keep an army of theirs on the field, peace out with them, let them run into some other trouble, and hopefully they die that way as someone else's hand, and you don't have to be the faction that eliminated them. So that's also going to be a strong play there. Executed our generals, released general of our... And see, there's honorable treatment of our soldier means we ransom their troops, but we executed some of their general, and that's going to impact things. Annexing a vassal, our other vassals will feel bad about that. Yeah, it all comes down to, you know, uh, collecting characters here. And some factions are going to view strategic threat a lot more than others in this case. Faction who dislike large or aggressive factions usually is negative 20. For them, negative 60. So that really just comes back to the personality is going to play a huge role uh, in terms of how people perceive you uh, depending on things like strategic threat or untrustworthiness and so forth. So hopefully this is a good summary for diplomatic attitudes and you have a better understanding of the game and what really makes diplomacy uh, tick and what you can expect uh, from different factions if you just pay a little bit of you know, attention to their personalities before you get into any sort of deals with them. So here, Koro, for example, has a diplomat personality and the friendly one. And so he's going to be a pretty decent faction uh, to make deal with. And um, for first peace and treaty over war, only declare war if otherwise the empire is secured. When conducting diplomacy, strongly considers the world reaction as in the wider diplomatic impact. So if you have a lot of friends that will be angry at him if he declares war on you, then he's not going to do it. So you can kind of predict AI actions if you actually read some of their personality as it's you know hard programmed in. They can only follow what's given to them. Alrighty, and that's going to end it for our guide here for diplomacy. Uh, we'll be talking about espionage next week. Hopefully you guys are enjoying these guides, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!